Um, instead, I think uh, we'll launch straight in. Um, I think the main uh, centre of this discussion is going to be about um, emissions and, and scrubbers, and, and when I talk about emissions, uh, sulphur emissions, um, I think in the time available that's uh, going to be enough, but um, we'll try and have some questions from the floor at the end. Um, so uh, to start with, I'm going to direct my first question to Jerome. Um, from the oil industry side, from the, the, the supply side, uh, do you feel the oil industry is ready for this uh, the 2020 sulphur cap? No. Um... Hello, thank you very much for the question, Simon, and uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to speak to, before such a, a great audience. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, yes, uh, I will start with this uh, question from the supply side, uh, representing Total, an oil and gas uh, uh, company. So, yes, um, the question is uh, more likely to, to be directed to the oil refining industry, and the oil refining industry, for sure, um, has had uh, decades of... Um, of uh, adaptation, I would say, uh, of investment uh, to uh, adapt to the new specification, whether in distillate, in gasoline, uh, in fuels, a reduction in the uh, yield of uh, uh, high sulfur fuel oil along the years by investing in, in delayed cookers, in uh, uh, resid desulfurization units. Uh, so uh, I would say on, in the, on the longer run and, and the global picture, I would say, yes, uh, the uh, refining industry has been steadily adapting to uh, such foreseeable uh, challenge, uh, which is the challenge of uh, switching from high sulfur to low sulfur, from heavy hands to uh, lighter hands. So that's the first thing. But the global picture now is not enough uh, because we have to adapt to the, uh, both the production of low sulfur fuels and uh, we have another challenge, with it, which is to manage the transition uh, from 2019 to 2020, which is uh, another one. Um, as such, for the low sulfur fuels production, uh, what I can say, uh, I may not speak for the oil industry, but the, uh, what we did at Total since uh, the last three years, since the, the decision by the IMO was taken uh, in October 2016, uh, we started a comprehensive a new product development program, and I think we're not alone, but that was a comprehensive one uh, leveraging our uh, technical centers. And we've developed uh, many receipts for uh, low sulfur fuels. As you know, it's going to be a blend. It's not going to be a straight run uh, product. It's going to be a blend. So we, we've tried a lot of blends, a lot of receipts, in order to make sure we had the capacity to produce, uh, the capacity to produce the quantities we need for our customers and that we would know about the quality because there are quality concerns. We may dig a bit into that later on. So at Total, yes, we are ready to, to, to supply. And the last word would be to uh, stress that now it's time to prepare for the transition. And the preparation is not only about refiners, it's not only about uh, the supply side, it's about discussing, uh, speaking all together and, and preparing. It's not, not a simple commercial bid offer relationship that we need. We need to prepare because um, what it is about is that at the end of this year, some will still need high sulfur fuels, others will already need low sulfur fuels, and the logistics, uh, the changeover from high sulfur to low sulfur in the logistics is not uh, overnight. So we need to prepare that by discussing, and the more we talk, as we do today, the smoother the transition. Thank you, Jerome. Um, if I uh, may move on to Claire from Shell. So, so you've got this tension between high sulfur fuel oil and low sulfur fuel oil. Do you, uh, as an owner operator, does one go for the, uh, the scrubber plus high sulfur fuel oil? Do you look out for low sulfur fuel oil? Because on the supply side, but bunk suppliers aren't going to have a huge smorgasbord of absolutely everything. So they're going to have to go for what their customers want. And, and what are their customers going to be looking for, do you think? I think, um, good morning everybody, I think the smorgasbord will be available but not necessarily all in one place and certainly to echo what Jerome said from a fuel per supplier perspective, obviously Shell plans to supply a range of fuels to its customers from the existing fuels that we have today, um, HFO for vessels with scrubbers, NGO, obviously we're also developing our own low sulphur blends and also supplying LNG um, which obviously is a, a compliance option for 2020 and also has other benefits such as lower um, carbon. But from an owner perspective, and obviously putting a different hat on, 
Shell also owns and operates its own vessels. And really it's a decision for each owner to take individually because there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. It does depend on the size of the fleet, it depends on the age of the fleet, and it's perhaps it's a decision that will be a different one depending on the individual vessel in a fleet. So the option that a container ship um, owner of ultra-large container ships takes may be different to the owner who's operating small chemical tankers in a coastal trade. So fundamentally, each owner, um, and to again echo uh, the, the need for preparation, I would expect a lot of owners have already had this uh, um, debate internally and uh, have decided what their approach will be to the transition and therefore uh, now as we approach 2020 it's about implementing the decisions that have been taken. But I would also say from, a, from a, uh, an owner perspective the fact that we are all having this dialogue helps all of us transition and certainly we're talking to our customers, putting my fuel hat it back on again, we're talking to our customers to make sure that both we and they are ready um, for the 1st of January. Thank you very much. Well, we're very fortunate to uh, have a couple of uh, uh, ship owning companies represented on the panel. Um, Kali, if I may bring you in, um, MD Pressure Shipping, uh, your fleet not installing scrubbers. Um, do you want to give us a few thoughts about your preparations for 2020? Sure. Uh, firstly, I think that uh, we must recognize that MARPOL is an anti pollution measure. And if you start mixing economics with it, then sometimes you get the wrong outcome. People would talk about scrubbers only if it makes economic sense. So it's really an economic decision. It's not a uh, decision that is uh, related to anti-pollution in that sense. Uh, so if, for example, scrubbers did not make economic sense, nobody would install them. And it's got nothing to do with pollution or non-pollution. Non and this is a big perception problem. Our industry has always been perceived as a polluting industry. And by putting scrubbers in, if you discuss this with a common man on the street, he says that, oh my god, you're taking this pollution which is going in the atmosphere and now you're going to dump it into the sea. And they just can't understand why we are doing it. So from a perception point of view also, this is a big issue. In terms of actual implementation, it's just a question of planning. Uh, for us, as we're going in for the low sulfur fuel oil, all we need to really do is focus on getting our tanks cleaned, getting them ready to receive low sulfur fuel oil, reaching out to our bunker contacts to make sure that we can get the right quality of oil at the right place, and then a question of how expensive, how cheap it's going to be. And for that, uh, we sometimes look at South America as a great example. Uh, we've bunkered our ships regularly in South America. And what we have noticed is that the high sulfur fuel oil that, you're, that you bunker at uh, South American ports has an actual sulfur content somewhere between 0.2% and 0.7%. And the price differential between South American high sulfur fuel, so-called high sulfur fuel oil and the 3.5% high sulfur fuel oil that you buy in Singapore is about $40, $45 per ton. Thank you. Um, and then bringing in Harris, uh, Starwalk have fitted scrubbers. Um, do you want to give us a counterpoint to your views and, and, and why you've done that? Of course, and thank you, Simon. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here, and I'm honored to be sitting on this panel today. So Starbulk, our company, um, has chosen to comply with IMO 2030 by installing scrubbers on the majority of our fleet, which comprises more than 100 vessels. Um, at the moment, uh, we're currently installing, and uh, we expect to have completed by end of April around 20, 25 is installations. We had our first scrubber uh, installation completed a year ago as a pilot, so we do have a vessel running on a scrubber for, uh, for a year now. Our goal is to complete all installations by early fourth quarter 2019 so that uh, this will allow us for enough time to operate the systems and make sure we are ready ahead of January 2020. 
We are very frequently asked why we chose for scrubbers and not to comply through 0.5 fuel. One of our major considerations was risk management. Scrubbers will allow us to continue burning heavy fuel oil, which is more, it is expected to be more economical than compliant fuel. And uh, this way, we protect our company from a potential market downturn in the future uh, because we'll be able to keep our costs lower. Um, of course, we also took into consideration the fact that we wouldn't have to deal with any operational or technical hurdles in terms of having to test uh, new compliant fuel. Uh, we wouldn't be faced with compatibility issues and uh, we wouldn't be faced with availability issues because by having a scrubber fitted on our vessel, we can comply at any given time, even when there isn't available fuel, compliant fuel in certain ports. Um, just to address the perception issue that uh, Halit mentioned earlier, scrubbers do offer many environmental benefits, uh, which are many times overlooked. In terms of air emissions, not only do they reduce sulfur emissions and particulate matter emissions, but they also reduce PAH emissions, which are harmful to human health, which is something that compliant fuel will not do. And at the same time, scrubbers provide also for a clean use of uh, heavy fuel oil, which is inevitably produced from the distillation process. Um, and they also ensure that there is less demand for compliant fuel and therefore um, ensure that there's more availability for the remaining fleet that will not be feeding scrubbers. Thank you. Uh, and just to, um, on, on this scrubber point, just to clarify the type of scrubbers you fitted, because Khalid alluded to this, uh, the perception issue of putting sulfur back in the sea. Of course, you've got open loops, closed loop and hybrid. Of course. Wh which have you gone for? Um, so we have opted for open loop scrubbers, which are hybrid ready. The reason we did not opt for closed loop scrubbers is because of safety considerations. Closed loop scrubbers um, require the use of caustic soda which would then require special handling and storage by the crew on board. Thank you. If I can bring Claire back in on, um, so th this is a question with, again, the preparedness is, is on, the, uh, on the supply side, you have the fuels and the various options. And then with the scrubbers, if you go open loop, you've got um, various concerns with the perception. And also recently you read about uh, various jurisdictions banning the use of, of closed loop scrubbers, so you can still enter those jurisdictions, but you can't actually operate your, 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 sorry, your open loop scrubber. Um, but then if you go for a closed loop scrubber, you're, you're then creating what I think is very uh, charmingly called sludge, which you then have to uh, dispose of somewhere. I mean, going back into this infrastructure question and the supply and demand, can I bring you in on that as well? On a very loosely worded <laughs> open question. Obviously, I'm not a port authority. Mm. Um, my, expect, my understanding is that port authorities um, will have the facilities available to um, receive the material from ships that operate in closed loop. Um, obviously, very few vessels have installed closed loop scrubbers, and it tends to be those operating in areas of brackish water. Um, vessels where they haven't opted for open, they're going for hybrid, which enables them to switch from one operation to another. And therefore, should they go into a port that has decided to um, limit the use of open loop scrubbers in its jurisdiction, then they would switch to closed mode during that um, phase of their operation. Um, and yes, you're right, those who have installed open loop, they will switch to a compliant fuel to enter that port's jurisdiction. Um, but again, the choice, uh, it's becoming clearer. The IMO is, um, is helping us as an industry by providing more guidance on the transition and on the approaches that owners, the, so the ship implementation plans, the non-compliant fuel ban, it's becoming a lot clearer how we as an industry need to, to um, transition. Um, and obviously that guidance is helpful to us all, fuel supplier and, and owner and operator, but it is up to the individual owner to decide on their particular approach um, that they decide to use. Scrubbers are a, a legally allowed method of compliance. Um, and it's up to the owner to choose what, which one they wish. Thank you. Can I just bring you back in? Um, what, what, one of the, uh, the subjects we've, we've talked about uh, has been this, um, back in 2016 when one was looking at the, uh, the, the, the IMO regulations coming in versus where we are now and uh, that implementation. Can I just draw you out on that a bit more as well? And then Jerome also. Um, 
shipping is a is a global industry, and it's 100% appropriate that we are regulated at a global level. Uh, the emissions from sulphur do have an impact on human health, and that impact has been quantified. And therefore, the IMO does have a responsibility for us all as an industry to deal with the emissions that come from shipping. Shipping is, as we all know, it's an incredibly efficient way of transporting goods long distance. Uh, but transporting 80% of global fuel, um, global trade, does have an impact on the environment, both in terms of um, sulphur emissions, but also obviously in terms of uh, carbon emissions, which the IMO is moving on to deal with next. Since um, October 2016, we have got progressively more certainty and certainly from our perspective, both as a fuel supplier and as a, an operator of vessels, the fact that the IMO was able to clarify quite early on that the implementation date will be the 1st of January 2020, that was very helpful because it did enable all of us to begin the preparations that we need to do. And now as we approach 2020, we're into that transition phase rather than perhaps the, um, the, the evaluation phase. Thank you. Um, sorry, Jerome, I was going to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, no, I, I may jump on uh, or, or anticipate your next question as well. But uh, I, I want to jump on this one. Uh, what we have all said uh, is that the 2020, well, it's the same for the longer, longer term uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. It's going to be a mix of solutions. And uh, our responsibility as suppliers is to, to provide these uh, solutions to uh, the shipping industry. And we, we should not focus on our side too much on whether a choice is the best or not the best. It exists. And scrubbers, they will represent uh, globally 10 to 20% of the uh, bunker fuel market. So 10 to 20%, you cannot ignore, so you'll have to, to supply. So we'll be ready to supply these 10 to 20% uh, high sulfur fuels to the market, to those who have uh, selected that technology. The rest of it will be low sulfur fuels. So <clears throat> indeed, we all, uh, are getting ready for that. And there will be other solutions along the way. Now we are very positive on uh, liquefied natural gas, indeed. It's uh, meeting and, and going beyond all regulations that we know today. So it's the best choice for, uh, I would say, the new builds in terms of environment. And the, the business case is, is good, too. Uh, so, but along the way, we'll find other solutions and that we'll put on, on the market as well, uh, should they work uh, in terms of economics and environment. So, yeah, I wanted to, to make that point that it's this mix of, of solutions that we need to get to be ready for. Thank you. Um, Khalid, if I can bring you in again. Uh, th this perception point, I think, is, is, is a crucial one and a, and a very uh, interesting one, probably not talked about that much. but. In, in terms of your journey from 2016 to now and, and managing the perception, can you, we have the, 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 the truly technical side, but on the perception, how, how does one? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> like I handle the investor relations part of our company and I meet so many investors. And one of the questions they always ask us about this scrubber business is that, isn't this leading to further pollution? And though, you know, you can tell them what you want, at the end of the day, the perception is that you're removing air pollution and putting it into the sea. And that's the reality. And we've got to deal with that. And uh, I don't know how the shipping world is going to really uh, handle that correctly, especially when so many ports all over the world have come out and said that we don't want open loop scrubbers to be polluting our waters. I mean, you, <laughs> It's very difficult when you have that type of a situation on hand. How do you go about changing that perception? It's, uh, I mean, our own industry is saying, on one hand, through the ports, that, listen, this is bad. We don't want this thing here. And uh, on the other hand, you're trying to say that, listen, we, we're really doing a good job. So, and, and I think the common man on the street doesn't really get it. So I think that this is a real problem for us. Uh, uh, the perception issue was never there because from day one we had decided that we would be going in for uh, low sulfur fuel oil options uh, simply because A, we realized that the price differential should not be that great having seen what happens in South America 
in terms of uh, the high sulfur fuel oil, which is literally low sulfur fuel oil, being sold at just a $40, $45 premium. So looking at that, uh, we always had the feeling that uh, the easiest solution would be just switch to low sulfur fuel oil, and for which you need to plan and prepare, which we've done. And all our ships should be ready by the third quarter of this year uh, with all tanks cleaned and already taking in low sulfur fuel oil at that point. Thank you. Um, and Harry, so how does one go about fighting that perception with, with having installed scrubbers, the, the, the information that you cleaned and the, and the decision behind it based on empirical evidence? Thank you, Simon. Um, firstly, it's, it's important to clarify that um, exhaust gas cleaning systems are an approved method of compliance um, as per Regulation 4 of MARPOL Annex 6. Uh, and for IMO to have reached this decision, it was an educated decision based on facts and science. Uh, so, of course, perception is important, but one has to look at the underlying science of things. Um, the most recent and most com comprehensive studies on discharge water from open loop scrubbers conclude that uh, there isn't any risk to the marine environment or to the seawater quality. Um, one such recent study is uh, the Japanese study, a study conducted by the Japanese government. Japan was, of course, interested to to see whether there is any impact whatsoever on their fisheries. Um, so what they did is that uh, they conducted an accumulation study uh, in which they assessed the impact of discharge water from open loop scrubbers in enclosed areas such as the Tokyo Bay where the, there is high congestion of ships. Um, they took a worst case scenario of having uh, all vessels calling these uh, uh, congested areas uh, being fitted with scrubbers for a period of 10 years. Um, and they concluded that any risk from uh, discharge water is negligible, whether uh, on marine aquatic organisms or on the seawater quality. Um, now, th there are other similar studies. There is, of course, also um, a DNVGL study, which was published recently, uh, which took uh, uh, around 300 samples uh, from cruise ships and assessed the constituents in the discharge water from open loop scrubbers. Um, uh, what this study basically did is that the, it compared the water constituents to major international water standards, such as the EU Water Surface Standard and the German Water Ordinance. It even went as far to compare water constituents in discharge water from open loop uh, with the World Health Organization drinking standards. In all cases, they concluded that uh, the water constituents were well within acceptable limits. Um, so uh, it is important uh, that all relevant stakeholders um, are informed, that they read the relevant studies, uh, and that uh, any decisions made uh, moving forward are based on science and on facts. Thank you. Um, sorry to put you on the mic so one more time. Uh, on, just going on to the, uh, the maintenance side of these scrubbers. I mean, you, you mentioned you've been, you've been monitoring for a year. Um, the estimated lifespan of a scrubber, because your, your, your bulk carrier could, could happily operate for 15 to 25 years, somewhere in that region. Um, how long do you see the scrubber operating within that? Because it's now an integral part of the ship. It's quite a, 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 a if my school chemistry serves me right, if you add hot sulfates and hot water, you make sulfuric acid and sulfurous acid. It's not a very conducive environment. How, how is that going with the maintenance and the operation of the thing itself? Yes, thank you, Simon. Um, so um, we expect the life cycle of an exhaust gas cleaning system to, um, uh, to last longer than the life cycle of a vessel. Uh, we use very high quality material in the systems that uh, we're uh, equipping our vessels with. Uh, we use uh, six and most stainless steel for the scrubber tower and uh, glass reinforced, reinforced epoxy pipes. Um, we have a more than 10 year warranty by our makers uh, for the towers, and as long as you don't have a pro problem with the tower, um, the rest of the maintenance is simple because we're talking about uh, water and gas analyzers, uh, sensors, pipes, water pumps. So uh, we, we are currently training our crews, um, our engineers and electricians, so that they are in a position to monitor the systems, to operate them, and to perform any repairs necessary. Uh, there will be a control panel on board from which our chief engineer will be able uh, to monitor the system. Uh, there will be real-time alarms in case uh, the system becomes inoperable. 
Uh, we will be monitor monitoring the systems also remotely from our office. Um, the maker is also uh, monitoring the systems remotely, so in case anything goes wrong, uh, we are making sure that our crews on board will be able to perform um, any repair necessary, and of course we will make sure that we have any consumables and spare parts necessary on board the vessels at any given time. Thank you. Um, and then uh, we were going to have some questions for the floor, we still will. Um, I just wanted to ask one more question of the panel, which just goes into the longer term, and, uh, uh, and certainly Jerome, you've alluded to this, and Claire, um, on the LNG side and beyond there even. Do you want to make a couple of comments on that? And, uh... Well, I, I can do a first comment a little bit. Okay, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> because the point is, the, I mean, there are two, two questions in your question, I would say. The first one is alternative energy readily available, which means uh, it is about uh, LNG. And then there are uh, the prospective ones, lay, uh, uh, yeah, um, a bit farther along the journey. So um, the first comment uh, we, we have on LNG, and I think we kind of have the same with uh, Charles, uh, is that uh, this uh, energy uh, is today uh, the the best option for an alternative to heavy fuels, uh, given the uh, av availability. When you look at it in terms of uh, terminals, uh, either uh, liquefaction terminals or gasification terminals throughout the planet, you, you, you have so much. So then in any place of the world now, you can have uh, liquefied natural gas available. It's only then a question of infrastructure, of, of bunkering vessels, of uh, uh, having the, the last mile organized. But it's not big investments. It's it's uh, softer, uh, so it's feasible in a sense. Uh, the cleanliness has been already, uh, I mean, uh, said. It's it's not only sulfur. It's a particle ma particle matters. It's a uh, nitrogen oxide, uh, and it's uh, about greenhouse gas emission. It's participating to the to the roadmap of the shipping industry uh, quite well. Uh, and also, there are many segments in the shipping industry, and this one is important, that, has, that have already adopted that, that fuel. Uh, the cruise segment, the container ship segment, the uh, row row segment, uh, now Aframag, BLCCs, tankers. Uh, so, I mean, there is a business case for it. And if there is one business case in a company, I don't see why there would not be uh, many business cases that work for other company. So yeah, I'm anticipating an uptake of this, uh, of this fuel uh, in, in the months to come. So that's the first point. And then I can go to the second point now, but it's very rapid. LNG took, like, uh, if you look at, at the CMSAGM uh, project, it took seven years to reach the moment when they would decide. And then uh, they step in. They are very, I mean, pioneer, but they are very uh, willing to, to go ahead with it. And I can tell you, within, uh, by, by 2030, it will not account for more than, let's say, 5% or uh, 5 to 10% of their fuel consumption, given the turnover of their fleet, because it's about new fleets. So within 20 years, you have 10%. So when you look at hydrogen, ammoniac, other fuels, it's going to be the same cycle, and so we cannot imagine that if we start today, we would have more than 10% by 2040. So it's going to be long. Okay. I think uh, yeah, I would echo a lot of what um, Jerome has said. Um, LNG is, when we look beyond IMO 2020, and obviously in shipping, shipping has a reputation for being quite short-termist in its outlook, but um, 2020 is obviously only months away, and then come 2023, the IMO plans to publish its decarbonisation roadmap. The only fuel we have available at the moment that enables us to embark upon this journey is LNG, uh, because coupled with um, energy saving uh, measures and technologies, it can deliver quite a significant um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction. Looking longer term, um, we don't have any other fuel available right now. There are fuels under development, so hydrogen, ammonia, biofuels, all of these may, in time, provide options for the shipping industry, but all of them at the moment um, require significant research and development to ensure that they are both safe, um, scalable, and also deliver the required emissions reduction. LNG um, has been used for the past 20 odd years in LNG carriers um, that, have, that run on LNG, and therefore we know it's safe, we know it's, um, it can be used, 
and as uh, Jerome says, it's successfully used in, across a range of vessel types now, um, from container ships to cruise ships to tankers. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, if, if anybody would like to ask one. Um, very few, but uh, do we have a microphone we can... No, uh, no question, but just a comment. As I've been to many of these uh, panel discussions in the last year, uh, owners should give themselves a break. Stop justifying scrubbers, not scrubbers. Oil companies should give themselves a break, compliant fuel, not compliant fuel. At, at the end of the day, what's important here? The important thing is that you're improving the quality of life, you're improving health conditions. 14 million children suffer from asthma related to stack emissions. This is a study done by Dr. James Corbett of the University of Delaware and also corroborated by uh, one of the Finnish technical uh, institutes. So you want to feel better about yourself? Think about uh, improving the lives of 14 million children who have asthma. Ever see a child choke, can't breathe? You all have children, I'm sure, grandchildren. It's a horrifying experience to see a child that can't breathe. Terrible. So. Think of the higher purpose we're doing here. And at the end of the day, you know, the credible owners will be compliant, whether they have scrubbers, not scrubbers. But I think if you, you look beyond uh, some of these, uh, these discussions, you, you'll find that uh, at the end of the day, owners, oil companies, everyone's doing the right thing. Just think of the 14 million children that can't breathe every day. Thank you. Uh, Keith Wallace from Journal of Commerce. T taking on board Khalid's point uh, about public perception, does, does, the, does the panel anticipate uh, further IMO sponsored regulation actually banning scrubbers in the future? May not, uh, may, 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 maybe not in 2021, but uh, longer term, 2025, 20, 2030? Thank you. Uh, some speculation there. Khalid, start with you. We've already got a ban on uh, open loop scrubbers being discharged in more or less all the major ports that you can think of. So yes, if that were logically extended, uh, you could have in maybe three to five years time uh, some sort of uh, ban on, uh, this, on this type of uh, uh, compliance uh, standards from the IMO. But I think more than that, I think technology will come in and we'll get a new solution. I don't think that uh, uh, that's going to be a real issue. I think technology will come in and answer this uh, in a much better way. Another question? Another question? Sorry. 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 Just, just a very short comment that um, there are a few ports that have banned open loop scrubbers. The majority of the ports worldwide do not ban open loop scrubbers. Um, uh, I think that uh, the IMO uh, should take into consideration the recent studies, which, as I mentioned earlier, prove that there isn't any risk from discharge water from open loop scrubbers, uh, and therefore we shouldn't expect to see more bans uh, in the near future. Sorry, was there another question? We've got one and a half minutes. Yes, yeah. hello. I'm uh, Cristina Santamaria from DMBGL. It's just a comment regarding a study that has been mentioned done by DMBGL. I just wanted to make a correction that the study was by, done by Carnival. We only did uh, third-party verification versus international regulations, and uh, you know the cumulative uh, effects of the scrubbers are yet to be seen. Uh, however, DMBGL as a class society will support uh, ship owners with whatever uh, technology they decide to go for to comply with uh, the global software cup. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Maite. Uh, I'm representing BIMCO here in Singapore. I just have one question regarding compatibility of the fuel for the, the bunker suppliers. Uh, the industry is really concerned about uh, how they can buy fuels in Singapore or in Houston or elsewhere with the same uh, spec without risking the compatibility uh, on best, in the best, on vessel. Uh, I know that sometimes some vessels have the segregation system, but what about those vessels that have not the capacity? What are your uh, thoughts about it? 
Um, I think we're back to the smallest border and supply of various fuels around the world and, 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 and how many and where. Um, Jerome. <laughs> I'm going to try. Uh, it's an important question. You're right. And, and, and you know, we, we've run a series of uh, um, forums with our customers these past uh, weeks, and uh, this concern about compatibility is really, uh, is really important. It is also something that we're found during our uh, uh, new product development program. So uh, thank you for the question, which is important to address. Um, on this, uh, I will be very short. Uh, compatibility concerns have already existed in the shipping industry, indeed. Uh, if it, it's been, uh, th there are some cases where uh, things were uh, turned bad. And the, there is uh, technical knowledge on, on board the vessel to, to, to look at it. I mean, it's just making compatibility tests on board the vessel. It's not, not rocket science. It's just you, you, you mix two drops of the fuels. You want to see if they are compatible, and, and, and you look at it in uh, that, that it's very simple uh, task uh, on board the vessel. So th that is something that has been managed. N now, now, when you look at uh, whether we can guarantee compatibility uh, between one supplier and another supplier, I can tell you today, it's, uh, tomorrow it's going to be the same as today, we cannot guarantee it indeed because we don't know the fuel that is being produced by, by, by the, the competitor, and we, can, we cannot do that. Um, what is uh, probably more feasible when you enter into specific discussion uh, with your supplier is if you are concerned because uh, 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 you have ex some experience or there has been some bad experience in the industry, if you are concerned about it, then the supplier can make you uh, uh, bespoke uh, fuel uh, that would guarantee compatibility, let's make this example, between Singapore and Rotterdam. I am, I am supplying in Rotterdam and in Singapore. If someone comes to me and says, I want it to be compatible between the two, I will look into finding a solution. But it will come with a premium. It will come with a premium because it's bespoke. I have to put logistics in place. I have to, to do a bit uh, more, more uh, um, cons put constraints in the, in the blends that I will perform. That, that's just it. Okay. Thank you. I think we have to draw a line under it there. Um, thank you to the panel very much. Um, they'll be around for the rest of the day, I'm sure, and you can uh, ask some questions then. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Panel, and uh, thank you to our moderator of the panelists. Great topic. Thank you for keeping the time. Uh, and now I would kindly ask uh, Her Excellency Natasha Pilidis, she is the Deputy Minister of Shipping from Cyprus, uh, to come and uh, make us a presentation on the very interesting topic, can regulation and competitiveness exist? Um, Natasha, thank you for being with us today, representing another major uh, industry hub. Thank you.